Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow. And the five-string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My Bigfoot sighting started when I was 13. Me and my family decided to go up to Washington to visit the Mount St. Helens area. And we uh, found a RV camp area and they're setting up camp. I was never the one to stay in camp. I didn't like what we call glamping now and stuff. So I always had my pack ready to go. And right where we backed into was an old abandoned logging road. So I told my parents I was going to walk down the road, find my own camp, set it up, and they never had a problem with this. I'd done it forever. And so I go walking down the road. I was about a mile away from the main campground, and I saw this great area to set up camp. It was a nice clearing, already had a fire pit ring. I thought this would be perfect. I start setting up camp. I've hunted and fished my entire life at that point, even though I was 13. So I'd been in the woods a lot and it was just dead silent. It, you didn't, you kind of got a spooky feeling from that because you know, whenever it's silent in the woods, if you've spent a lot of time, it means there's a predator around. My thought was, it's probably either a bear or a cougar. So I wasn't too worried. And so I was setting up camp and I kept getting the feeling I was being watched. And so I started scanning around, didn't really see anything. So I kind of put it out of my mind and I was crouched down. I was putting my last tent stake in and I settled on where it was coming from was an old stump. So I'm sitting there crouched down, my last tent stake in my hand, just getting ready to put it in and the stump stood up. And it was a female Bigfoot, about eight and a half, nine foot tall, very broad shouldered. She was only about 10 feet from me. About five foot across its shoulders. Her hair was black with kind of a silverish white tips to it. Um, no neck, conical shaped head, kind of a flat nose spread out. She had blocked teeth that were kind of yellowish. Not really inset, but kind of not really inset eyes, but deep set. They're black. And when she stood up, I was crouched down, like I said, 10 stake in my hand. But the odd thing was I wasn't frightened. She didn't give off a vibe like she was going to hurt me at all. So generally what you do with most predators, you stand up, you try to be bigger. I never got the feeling I should stand up at all. So I just stayed in my position. But she never looked at me either. She was looking kind of past me and she was doing these chirps, whistles kind of sounds. And I think I had one behind me and she was like, it, no, I wasn't a threat. That's my guess. I don't know for sure, but that's kind of how it felt. So then she turned and within three or four steps, she literally just evaporated into the forest. I never heard her walk complete silence just amazing how quiet she was for her size and so i stood up kind of gathered my thoughts walked back to camp and i kind of pulled my dad aside and because i didn't want to say anything to my mom because i didn't want her to worry and i told him and his first thought his first thing he said was it was a bear i said no dad i know a bear bears aren't that big here so he agreed to walk back to the camp with me And so we started back down towards where I was camped. And all of a sudden we heard like what sounded like a bulldozer going through the forest. And he looked at me and I just grinned at him. And I said, well, I think that was your bear dad. So we took a left and we kind of walked into the forest a little bit. 
and we saw this path that was literally um, six, seven, eight, eight inch saplings that were literally snapped f from this massive animal going through the forest. And we looked down and there was a 13 inch, almost 14 inch track that was pressed into the ground. Now, my dad was 260, 270. He could barely make any indent into the ground. And this thing was pressed in a good inch or so. So he looked at me. We continued on back to my camp at that point, And we didn't see anything. So he wanted to go into town, get some plaster cast. And he didn't want me to say anything to my mom because he didn't want to worry her either. So we went into town, got plaster cast, came back out. My mom was asking what was going on. My dad said, oh, we found a bear print. I just want to cast it. So my mom didn't ask anything past that. So we went back out. We casted that track. And he asked me, are you sure you still want to camp out here? Do you want to camp nearer to the camper? I said, no, I'm fine. Because like I said, I never got a feeling of she wanted to hurt me or I was in danger or anything like that. So that night I made a fire. I was got done eating, went to bed. And as my fire was dying down, I saw this massive hand just sit down on my tent, kind of feel the material. And I kind of heard her or him. I'm not sure which one it was at this point. But I heard them uh, rustling around my camp, moving stuff around. And I just laid there. Once again, I never got a feeling of it was going to hurt me or anything. Got up the next morning, noticed that there was just nothing disturbed. It was like whatever it was doing, it made it kind of made the intelligent decision not to make it obvious that it was there. So that was my first in, encounter at that point. Like I said, I never got scared by it. It never frightened me. I know so many times you hear these stories of people being very, very scared or shocked or not sure what to do with their encounter. Mine was totally the opposite. Mine was very pleasant and friendly, almost a curious encounter in a sense. And it really launched me into researching these animals more or primates or whatever you want to call them. So many people have their own opinions of what they are. So I was never terrified or scared. And I think a lot of times you're dealing with something that does not exist. So when you do encounter that, I think that is part of the fright factor is you're always taught and told these things are just a myth. They don't exist. So it does scare you a little, but she didn't, she was very, very calming. It was almost like she was putting off something that made you just mellow out in a sense and not worry about it. I think had she wanted to hurt me, I would be dead. Like I said, 10 feet from her, she could have closed that gap in no time at all. I had no weapon. Maybe that was one of the things that made her kind of also have a very calming experience is I wasn't armed. I was a 13 year old kid. I was no threat to her. And she knew that how I knew it was a female. She had breasts. She was, I think, an older female, and I think that because of the white tips to her black fur, she just never really looked at me. That was the other odd part, is she never really paid attention to me. She was more concerned about what was behind me, and that's why I think I had one behind me as well. Now, at the time, I wasn't quite understanding what was going on but through the research i've done i think i had one behind me and she was letting it know as well that i was no threat so we casted it i saw it this led me into researching these creatures more and i have read many things i've watched many things since then and there's so many theories out there of what these things are whether they're primates aliens I personally think that you're dealing with a primate. I think it's a definite primate, and it's as intelligent as we are. They know what to do and how to avoid us. But once again, I just can't believe how massive this thing was, and within three to four steps, just evaporated into the forest. It was like she was never there. Clear up to my sighting of her, thinking she was an old stump, and how well she was blended in. So it's no wonder that you don't see these things very often.
I was around 25 when I had my first audio experience with these things. I was up hunting in the Malala area of Clackamas, Oregon. And me and my hunting partner were sitting around the campfire. And we heard one start howling, kind of doing a howl scream up on a ridge behind us. And then a second one started answering that one that was across the river from us. And this lasted about 20 to 30 minutes. It was hunting season, so it was kind of cool, but not too bad. And we heard these things talking or howling and screaming back and forth. And the one across the river never did move. It would howl, scream to the one up on the ridge. Then the one on the ridge would return its call. But it, you could hear it obviously moving down the ridge, but keeping a distance from us at the same time and finally we heard it come down and it was probably i'd say half a mile or so from our camp and you could hear it get down to the river the one by us was still call howling to it and then we're assuming that it crossed the river and then everything just went silent and we never did hear it again for the rest of the night or the rest of the hunting trip I thought that was very interesting that the one across the river from us never did move its position. It was like not afraid that we were that close where the other one kept its distance from our camp. Then my third audio experience was when I was 30. Once again, it was a hunting trip up in the Malala's. And that one I had gone down an abandoned logging road and I had stopped my truck got out and it screamed so loud so hard that you could feel it inside it literally vibrated my insides and that was the first time that i was actually scared that one spooked me and that was a definite you just need to turn around and go that's the way i interpreted that one and that's exactly what i did i just got back in my truck i didn't stick around to see where it was what it was nothing that was probably the most powerful scream I have ever experienced. And I just got back in my truck and turned around and left. That was the first one that actually scared me. The first two did not. That one I took as a absolute warning that I did not need to be there. And I was in the wrong place, wrong time. That was also up the mall of, but that was more towards the Estacada Colton area of the mall area up there. So, been scared once. First two, no, but just just that one, and it was very strange. It was very, very different than what I have experienced the the first two times. So I also get why people would be scared of these things. I didn't up till that point. Up to that point, I would hear these stories or see these shows, and I'd always wonder what are people afraid of. That one was different. That one did bring fear into me so i did get where these people were coming from all of a sudden and it just made me dig into the research even more it's like how many times and how aggressive can these things get and i think if you don't pay attention to when they do warn you then things can happen but that's like any animal they'll warn you first then it's if you're not smart enough to take that warning things can go very very badly for you at that point my bigfoot sightings happened in louisiana and mississippi my first experience was in mississippi i'm from louisiana we was at my grandparents farm in north mississippi they own about 3,000 acres up there. I own it now since everybody has passed away. It was left to me. Me and my sister was probably eight or 10. And my grandma and grandpa had a farm. And they had an old bull, an uh, old mean burner bull that we wasn't supposed to mess with. And we was up there one weekend, and he grew apples and stuff like that, green apples and red apples and cantaloupes and watermelons and he grew them behind the barn where the bull was in and we wasn't supposed to go near, nowhere near it and he had a huge fenced in front yard with barbed wire 
and had an oak tree, probably half the size of my pickup around that he used to train his horses on and tie his mules up to when he got through plowing. And he was on the other side plowing with old Betsy the mule. And then my sister decided we wanted an apple. So we snuck through that barbed wire pasture fence and got through the other side where the chute was, where that bull was at. And uh, about that time, we heard a huge tree limb fall on the right side corner of the barn where the tree line was. And we stopped. We thought it was my grandpa. And we just froze. We didn't think nothing about it. And about that time, it looked like a big, huge monkey or a chimpanzee just jumped back in the tree. And we stood there and watched it for about 10 or 15 seconds when it disappeared. And we looked for Grandpa, and we shot back around that chute where that bull was and got some apples and stuff and run back through the barbed wire close to that tree. And about that time, that big Bramer bull got loose. And he tore the front chute part open and got in that field with me and my sister and we hightailed it behind that tree and here he come and right before he reached us he's probably uh he was probably 15 yards from us before he got to that tree that we was hiding behind and whatever that was that we seen it stepped out between us and that bull and grabbed it and twisted his neck dead right there. And my sister screamed and took off running toward the house and climbed up under the barbed wire and it cut her little legs like razor blades all up. And I turned around and looked at whatever that was that grabbed that bull and he made it past where the tree line was and stopped and turned around and just stared at me for probably five or 10 seconds. And turned around and walked through the trees and here come my grandpa and i just knew that was it i was never going to see my next birthday that it was over with and he grabbed me by the nap of my neck and slung me over that top of that barbed wire fence and put us on the porch and my grandmother was tending to my little sister's cuts all over her little legs man and only thing my grandpa told us was, I told y'all don't ever go back there, didn't I? I'm like, yes, sir. And he said, are you okay? I'm like, nope. <laughs> and uh, he just kind of giggled. He said, don't ever go back there again. I told y'all that. And that was pretty much the end of that because he, he kept a razor strap on his porch. And we knew what that strap was for besides the mules and the horses. And uh, he just turned around and walked off. And years later, after he passed away, my sister finally brought the subject back up. And my grandmother told us that they knew they was there. They'd been there a long, long time. And uh, my grandpa grew them apples and them watermelons for them. And they didn't cross the tree line beside the barn on his property. And my grandfather didn't go over there. But they knew they was there. And he raised all that fruit and stuff just for them. They was both Native American, so I, I don't know if that was like a peace offering or a, a gift, or I really don't know to this day, but I know he respected them. And uh, years later, my grandmother passed away, and I was I got the house and the land. And when my grandfather died, right before my grandma passed away, she used to tell us that somebody was putting watermelons on her porch. And... Uh, they didn't have any neighbors. The nearest neighbor was probably five or six miles down the road. So we think it was a Sasquatch doing that like a thank you or whatever. That would be my first experience with them. My second Sasquatch sighting was in Louisiana with my brother. I was raised there. We was raised in the woods, hunting and fishing like every normal country boy was back then. We'd been in the woods our whole life, and uh, my brother was about, he was a little older than me, and uh, we was out there one night in a swamp where we always stayed at, fished and hunted, whatever, and uh, we had a boatload of alligators that we had caught, and we made it up on the bank of this little island, and uh, 
sat there. My brother smoked cigarettes. He rolled his own cigarettes because he was an army vet, Vietnam vet. And uh, he rolled his own cigarettes and he heard something behind us. I'm standing there on the bank holding the rope to the boat, to an aluminum boat. And he heard something. And I don't know what he heard, but he said, hold the rope. I'll be right back. And uh, he took off through the wood, through the swamp. And uh, I'm standing there in the pitch dark. Uh, the only thing we see is the moonlight. You know, you can see pretty decent in the swamp. And we didn't hear no crickets, no canaders, nothing. I mean, there was nothing, no noise whatsoever. And that was kind of unusual for being in the swamp at night. And anyway, I kept waiting on him. He kept waiting on him. And next sound I heard was something step to my right side in the water on the right side of the boat by the back. And I turned around and it was, it had to have been nine or 10 feet tall. It had to have been because we had the boat docked. It was probably three, maybe four feet of water to the rear of the boat. And where he stepped off and splashed and I turned around the scene, the water was up to his knees right there. So he was huge. He turned around and started walking and turned back around over his left shoulder and just stared at me and turned back around. He walked straight across the swamp and that kind of put the fear of God in me there. I, I don't know if he was there all along behind that tree or I don't know, but uh, there was a cypress tree that was broke about two and a half feet round. If you know anything about the swamp, and the cypress, you can hear anything for miles in a swamp. And there was no noise. There was no, there was nothing. And I, I didn't hear him breathing. I didn't hear nothing. I didn't smell him till he, I heard him hit the water. And that, that's pretty much ended that for us on that night right there. My next Bigfoot sighting in Mississippi would be by my home place. I live on a dead end road. There's about 3000 plus acres across the street from me, about 75 yards. There's a river about 150 yards back there that runs through Mississippi and everywhere else. Louisiana, Mississippi, it just keeps going. We was back there one night riding four wheelers and, uh, there's an old skitter trail at the end of this dead end road that's been there since the sixties and, uh, it's all grown up, but it's still a trail. We ride four wheelers back up in there and, uh, you can go forever at night on it. And we was riding around at night down there and there's a sandbar Creek bank on the left-hand side. that's about 20 feet wide and probably seven, eight feet deep. It used to be a river Creek, but there's only like, uh, there's probably maybe half of maybe a foot of water in it now. Everything else is dried up, but it's got sand and big limestone rocks in it. And if you don't know where it is at night on a four wheeler, it'll kill you if you get off down in there or hurt you real bad. But we was riding four wheelers down there one night and we stopped at a tree line about 200 yards back up in there where they look like a ryegrass field on the right. And then a tree line was probably. 70 yards maybe 60 maybe 70 behind it and you can see it in the moonlight back here because there's no street lights and uh we sat there and got off smoked a cigarette we just opened the beer because we was about 200 something yards back up in there and we still had another half a mile to go or so where we was going and we was sitting there and i was parked on the left hand side the side of the creek bank was about a foot from my four-wheeler to the left. And all of a sudden, we heard some noise running through the trees. And we seen the ryegrass moving back. I said, man, what is that? And about that time, it was a deer that jumped out of the field and cleared us. And his hoof hit me in the back of the head when he jumped over us. Like to knock me off my four-wheeler. And made it to the other side of that creek, and we turned the lights on and turned around and spotted him. And he was soaking wet with sweat. It looked like he bit like he run a horse. I've never seen that before, not from a deer. And he was panting and panting, 
And all of a sudden, he's, his ears and his head caught back up, and he shot off again. And next sound we heard, behind it, you could hear something coming through the woods after it. We figured it'd be a wild hog. They used to have wild hogs up in here, but not anymore that we know of. But whatever it was, it was hitting the ground so hard when it was moving. It sounded like he was hitting the ground with a sledgehammer. Just boom. You could literally feel it. And he got to the edge of whatever it was, got to the edge of that tree line and let out this scream that I won't ever forget. This roar scream, man. And we turned around and, and we was gone. That was it. We, we did, you know, we ain't. I've been back down in there a couple of times, but uh, that was the end of that ride for that night. So I know what it was, and my buddy knows what it was. We went back about maybe two days later, maybe. I found one print that was 17 inches, and I found another one about 60 yards past that. And that was the only two prints we found up through there. So I think we interrupted his dinner that night. But uh, that would get your attention quick. This is another story of mine that happened here in Mississippi by my house. We were sitting under my carport one night, me and a friend girl of mine, barbecuing. It was probably about 8.39. Uh, it was dark, full moon. We were sitting here with the lights off. Had a little small TV out going, just sitting here chilling, waiting on the grill. and. We heard something like a loud grunt or something because I've seen deer over here all the time across the street. And I got up and I didn't see anything with my spotlight. I didn't want to turn my outside lights on. So we sat back down and all of a sudden we heard this sound that would just literally curl your insides. I mean, it was so loud. It just about vibrated us under my carport about 70 yards away. It was just, it, I can't explain what it was. I know what it was, but I can't explain the sound. And I got up and shined my spotlight where the noise was coming from. And you could literally see the top of the trees that's probably 30, 40, 50 feet high, just swaying back and forth from side to side down there at the, at the end of the dead end road. It never come through the tree line, but uh, I don't know what the scream was for. I don't know why he screamed like that, but that was one night that got my attention, and a few nights after that, something hit the back of my house where my bedroom is. I don't live in a brick house. I live in an old 120-year-old house that's remodeled. No central heat and air, just window units, stuff like that, but it's a, it's a nice house. Whatever that was, hit the back of my house and woke us up. And I got up and went out there with a flashlight, and you can see the handprint. And the bottom of my window, I'm six foot two, and the bottom of my window in my bedroom comes to my chest. So whatever hit that was halfway up to the top of that window, pretty close to seven, seven and a half feet. That right there kind of scared me. Because it was a nice hamper, and I took pictures of it, but I never washed it off. And ever since then, every once in a while, they haven't done it in a long time, but about every two or three weeks, it, it's around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, they wake me up. They'll come back there, and they'll slap my house. I don't know if it's juveniles just telling me they want to play, because I have a small group over here by me now. I don't know. I mean, they don't mean me no harm. That's obvious because if they did. They could rip my door off, but they haven't done that in a while. So I, I kind of got used to that. They used to leave me deer legs in my yard. I didn't know why they did that because I don't feed them. I don't give them treats or nothing like that. I interact with them. I mean, I speak to them when I go in the woods to let them, you know, they know I'm there. I found out after all the years I've been following my forest friends, uh, I call them beings. They're not creatures and they're not animals. They're beings. If you see one, there's probably four or five more around you that you don't even know about. They'll lure you into one spot and then circle back on you. They're good at that. The juveniles here like to play hide and seek with you. I found that out. We've been doing that for about three years now whenever they hear, because they follow the seasons. But 
whenever they hear, they'll let me know they're here. And they follow the seasons. Like I said, they want to play, uh, which I think is very interesting. I've got hair samples from them. I've got footprints from them. I got pictures of them. There's no doubt they are here. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. I'm following five counties now by myself because I don't take nobody with me. I don't take firearms because pff, that's a waste of time. I just want to acknowledge them and they acknowledge me if I'm allowed to go. They'll let you know quickly if you're not. Um, you need to leave. I don't hunt them. I study them. I don't believe in hunting them. I don't believe in making money off of them. But the government is forcing their hand right now. Everywhere you look, there's a dollar store coming up in a field or a subdivision or so they building houses and you know they they don't understand what they're doing to these beings, man. They're forcing their hand out. They're taking their land. You know, you're taking their home away from them when they do that. And uh, that's why they get more irritable and more and more sightings of them. And the first thing everybody wants to do is put a bounty on one and go out there and kill one. And my advice to you on that, the people that want to do that, you need to be staying in your recliner watching YouTube because uh, that'd be your last trip if you ever went out there and tried to kill one. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to MyBigfootSighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down no-horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies grooving With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music yeah.